Hi, I'm Jack Farley with Real Vision. Welcome to The Daily Briefing. It's November 12th, 2020. I'm going to be joined shortly by our managing editor, Ed Harrison. But first, Peter Cooper with The Day's Stories. Thanks, Jack. Since November 4th, the U.S. has been breaking above the 100,000 daily COVID cases threshold, with yesterday reporting 144,270 new cases, according to the COVID Tracking Project. Hospitalizations are also peaking at 65,368, which you can see are similar levels to the other two waves we've had this past year. 12,518 COVID patients currently in the ICU, the highest it's been since May 5th. The COVID tracking project also reported new deaths at 1,421 for yesterday, about 36% change in the past 14 days. Part of the increase in case counts is due to new tests, which has seen an increase of 6.6% in the past seven days. Even while more testing is being done, positivity rates are also increasing nationally. The seven-day moving average for positivity rates is increasing exponentially. This data point helps shed light on whether we are doing enough testing to identify cases in order to gauge the extent of the disease's spread. Johns Hopkins says that a higher positivity rate could, quote, suggest that a community may largely be testing the sickest patients and possibly missing the milder or asymptomatic cases. A lower positivity may indicate that a community is including in its testing patients with milder or no symptoms, end quote. In other words, the extent of COVID-19 spread in the U.S. may actually be greater than what we are capturing in the data. Now for some better news. The jobless claims report stated that initial jobless claims declined to 709,000, seasonally adjusted, a decrease of 48,000 from the previous week, making it the lowest it's been since the initial spike in March. The drop in those on unemployment went from 7.4 million to 6.8 million. Although we're not back to pre-pandemic levels yet, these numbers demonstrate slow-paced yet growing strength in labor markets and overall demand. It also highlights some weaknesses as unemployed persons may be exhausting their benefits and continue to remain unemployed. People have also been dropping out of the labor markets. The BLS reported last week that the labor force participation rate is still fluctuating below where it was earlier this year. To break these things down for us and see if and how markets are responding to this, now we have Jack and Ed. Thanks, Peter. Welcome, Ed. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. It's good to talk to you, Jack. Yeah, good to good to be back uh, doing the main segment. Um, so you know, as Peter was just talking about um, the jobs number. Do you have do you have any th- thoughts about that? Yeah. So those jobless claims that came out today, my sense is that this the number that came out. I think it was seven hundred eight thousand. That was that's a good number. Uh, it shows that we are seeing a steady decline from the the levels that we saw in the September time frame, even into the October time frame, where it was around 900. It started to slip into the 800s, but now it's already down to 700,000. If this is the sort of level that we see going forward, uh, that, you know, continuing to ratchet down, then that 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 pretends well. The the caveat I would say, you know, there's twofold. One is 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 that 708,000 is a really big number by any stretch in previous cycles. So we're still at levels that are the highest levels at of previous cycles. And this is what now seven months into uh, the, po- the 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 post lockdown period. And then the second thing I would mention is that uh, there's the virus, right? So my view is is that this 700 number is likely to rise uh, due to restrictions that are starting to be put in place in the U.S. now as a result of coronavirus. And so even though 700 is good, we still have to see whether or not we can hold this downward trajectory over time. Right. Uh, You mentioned COVID, and I want to get into that in a second. But first, just on the jobless claims, I know I noticed in your credit uh, write-down uh, newsletter today, you mentioned the city surprise index um, and you know the differential. Um, what can you tell me about that and what it means for bond yields and just the, the economy going forward? Yeah, so the city surprise index, uh, city group surprise index, it's an index of the economic surprises up or down relative to expectations. And really, what it, it's saying to you is, look, you know, all this information is priced in. These are the expectations that uh, that people have. And if it's it, the expectations are exceeded or if they're not met, then we should expect, given that the information is priced in, that there's going to be a reaction. So a, a, an example would be if, you know, in the next three or four weeks, we get really high jobless claims numbers 
uh, higher than we expected. Those are worse than expected. So that would be a negative surprise. That would go into the city surprise index in a negative way. So it takes all of these economic data, and then what it does is it spits out a number uh, in terms of the aggregate as to whether the aggregate data levels are below uh, what was expected or above. What we've seen actually over the last several months uh, is a massive spike up. Once we came out of the lockdown, the post-lockdown period, you know, nothing uh, in the order of the surprises that we've seen have we seen in previous cycles uh, that city has looked at. And even today, we're still at a level, even though it's below where we were, you know, just in the June, July, August timeframe, we're still at a level that's pretty high relative to other cycles. So we're at a level that's a about the highest that you've seen and other cycles in the city surprise index. Uh, so to me, that's very supportive of uh, the economy. It, what it says is, is, is that you know risk assets uh, are, are underpinned by that and that uh, bonds are not underpinned by that. So it's negative for bonds, positive for stocks. But of course, as I said, it's a mean reverting series and we're still reverting to the mean. So yeah. um, you know when I talked about underperforming in terms of jobless claims, you know, if we were to underperform, that would get get us closer to the mean. And usually when we when you go to the mean, you go to the mean and then you go underneath. So my expectation is at some point in time, the city surprise index will start to be negative uh, for the economy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we can include that chart um, in the in the description. Um, it, it's a very interesting chart. It's definitely the highest in the series until at least it goes back, which is 2003. Um, one thing that, that you mentioned is that there's a big correlation um, between the 10-year uh, bond yield, or at least the 13-week change in that yield, and the thing. So when you overperform, you expect um, bonds to sell off. But one thing is very absent in that chart is that bonds haven't um, sold off. And I think a lot of that is because rates are, are so capped. You know, the, the Fed going to 3% is, is not a, a real reality now, right? Yeah, I think that you know we're range bound to a certain degree mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, there's the zero lower bound. So how far down can the yields go? You know, I think they went down to uh, the 45, 50 basis point level on the 10 year, and then uh, when we go up, that's going to be really negative. The steeper the yield curve is, at some point, it's going to be really negative for the economy because you know we're in a really convex point in the yield curve. If the yields go up too much, then it's going to stop out the economy. I think the closest that we came to that sort of activity was perhaps in 1994. You know, the, the Fed in 93 and 94 was raising interest rates, and it was doing it so aggressively after the, the recession that we almost had the economy get stopped out as a result of that, and they had to backpedal a little bit uh, and put it on pause. But um, I, I don't see that any of that happening as yet. We're very low relative to where we need to be in order for that to, to occur. Right. Interesting. Uh, you mentioned bonds. Um, I'm just looking at um, just the Treasury yields today. There was a pretty big rally in Treasuries as uh, equities across the board um, sold off. Um, what, what do you make of, of that move uh, into the safer Treasury market, particularly on the, the longer end of the curve? Yeah, so I have, uh, you know, I, I, after I wrote my note today, I was writing it with you in mind and talking about this. I was thinking about how to frame it, and I have three market themes that I'm thinking about that are in the market right now. There's the risk on, risk off trade. There's higher inflation and higher yields versus lower inflation and lower yields. And then there's uh, this whole concept of uh, some sense of rotation into value over growth. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are three big questions that people are asking themselves in order to deal with those macro themes. The one is how quickly can the vaccine be administered at scale? The second is how much damage will the virus do before this vaccine is administered at scale? And the third is how much impact will that damage uh, from the virus have on the actual economy? So I, I think those are the three biggest issues in terms of those three play. So when you ask me specifically about, for instance, uh, bonds, I think that a steeper yield curve because the Fed is pinned at zero when you have uh, a steepening 
what that is a sign of is a bullishness. That means that you have a risk on. So risk on for equities, and that means that uh, bonds will sell off. Uh, in a scenario in which the vaccine's delayed, if there's a lot of damage before it actually comes into play, and that damage leads to economic damage, that's one in which act th that bullish scenario doesn't come to pass, where you have a flattening of the yield curve, and then you have uh, equity selling off. And that's exactly what we saw today. You know, I think that the move in 10-year rates was something in the order of eight basis points, which is mm -hmm. a pretty significant move, given how uh, little, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, the yield curve has moved. And you saw a rotation out of the value over growth scenario. And I'm looking at value over growth now more to be a proxy for, uh, you know, uh, good things happening in the economy. Because the reason that people are getting into these growth stocks is not because they want growth, because growth is great and the economy is doing well. It's because the economy is doing poorly and the value stocks, the things that should take off at the beginning of any cycle, you don't want to be in those things. You want to be in the things that you can hide in that will do well in any economic environment. Those are sort of the fang stocks. And so today is a reversal of the reversal, as Charlie McGallagher said in his newsletter earlier today. Uh, th this whole thing about the vaccine causing people to go into value for the second day in a row, he was saying this morning, even before the, the, uh, the, the stuff hit the tape, that we were lined up for a, another reversal of the reversal and that held throughout the entire day, and that's what we saw. Yeah, uh, that you sent me that Charlie McElliott uh, note. It was uh, it was quite something. Uh, definitely way over my head. Whenever people talk about Vanna and Charm, I usually am like, all right, this is uh, ancient Greek to me. Um, just on the value and growth thing, yeah, just a, a you know, um, companies like Carnival, Cruises, um, Simon Properties, all those very risky assets that need. Um, you know, providers to recede quickly in order to perform well. Uh, they got obliterated today. You know, I've been following the uh, movie exhibitors, companies like AMC, uh, Cineworld, um, Cinemark. Um, and meanwhile, yeah, the FANG stocks, uh, they, they were escaped relatively unscathed. Um, so I, I know there was a lot of fanfare about uh, the value, the move into value. Um, you know, JP Morgan put out, put out uh, quite a report that uh, made the rounds. Um, and then, you know, the past Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there was that move from growth into value. What, where are we at now? Now that that trend has seemed to reverse, has, is this, that uh, three days, is that just an interregnum in between a move towards, you know, more growth? What do you think, uh, what's your framework going forward on that? Yeah, so I think that we got it over our skis a little bit. I mean, there was the initial uh, reaction to the to the vaccine, which is uh, notable, and you know that was a massive move. I mean, that was the biggest move in value over growth on a single day since 2001. So a 19 year high in terms of the, dis the you know the dispersion uh, compressing back to where it, uh, it, it would go. But I think that the jury's still out in terms of what, the three things that I was talking about earlier. You know, in terms of how I'm framing it, the three questions. Uh, we don't know how quickly the vaccine can be administered at this particular point. There are some concerns about that. But even before we get there, you know, all, all the hints are that there's going to be considerable damage from the economy uh, because, of the vac uh, because of the virus. And, uh, and you, you may, we may end up getting localized shutdowns. Here in the, in the D.C. area where I am, actually, there already are shutdowns. Like, for instance, Prince George's County, which is the next county over from where I live, they are moving from a 50 percent uh, occupancy in restaurants to a 25 percent occupancy in restaurants indoors. And they had considered whether or not they were just going to have no indoors. And, and they're really telling people you should have more takeout uh, than, than, you should, uh, than you had beforehand. So all of those things are really starting to bite. People are starting to think about it. And, you know, I wrote a decent amount about this today. I said that, you know, in the, in, in the U.S., there's increased testing, which means increased case counts. So it's not clear how much of the rise in uh, case counts is representative of a true rise in infectiousness. But when you look at the virus, uh, the positivity rates uh, in terms of how, what percentage of people are positive is increasing across the country. You can see that in places like California. You can see it in New York. You certainly see it in the upper Midwest. And so 
uh, that's number one. Number two, all else equal, case counts rising means that hospitalizations will rise. And, uh, you know, obviously all else is not equal. It depends on who gets infected. You know, if a young guy like yourself gets infected, it's probably less deadly than if, uh, um, you know, an 80-year-old uh, man gets infected. Um, and, and we do know that younger people are getting infected, and, and that's a healthier sample group. And that should lead us to believe that hospitalization rates will rise less than the case counts. But the case counts are up so much, I think it's over 60 percent, almost 70 percent, that even hospitalization rates are rising to a record level. So we have a record level of cases. We have a record level of hospitalizations. Then, again, all else equal, hospitalization rates going up means deaths will rise again. But just as I said, with regard to hospitalization, it depends on who gets infected, how healthy they are, how virulent the virus is, and how capable our medical professionals are in mitigating the impact of the disease. Uh, even so, 36% is the death rate uh, change but uh, over the last 14 days. That means that the number of people who are dying today is 36% higher than it was 14 days ago. If that number holds, by Thanksgiving, we'll be up to 2,000 deaths a day in the United States, which is on par with where we were back in uh, the, the, the worst part of uh, the February, March, April timeframe. So to me, what that, the data suggests is, is that while case counts may overstate the impact in sickness, uh, the rise in the caseloads is so high that we are going to get shutdowns. Like, uh, it's not just going to be, you know, we're moving to 25 percent the way that Prince George's County did. It's that we're going to get localized shutdowns exactly the same way they had in Europe, and that's going to have a very negative effect on the economy. So the, the price action that you've seen today is much more reflective of the downside risk that's apparent as a result of the virus. Yeah, uh, it's it's very very grim, um, and I I think the it's quite apparent that if we have a lockdown scenario, like you said, it's going to be very bad for uh, equities, particularly value. Um, what can you tell me about? Let's say that what can you tell me about this scenario where um, cases continue to spiral uh, out of control, but we don't have a shutdown? What do you think is going to be the case? Uh, how how is that going to impact? Like, are is human behavior going to sort of uh, be bad for equities, even if there were no, uh, if, even if there weren't a shutdown? Yeah, I mean, that's the case that we're, we're, uh, that we're thinking about now. I mean, just because, uh, A, people die or because uh, there are more infections doesn't mean that the economy is going to implode. Uh, you know, it will implode to a certain degree if you shut it down. But, you know, the question is, is if you don't shut it down, what happens then? I mean, my sense is, is, is that uh, it, it all boils down to healthcare system overload. This is where the Europeans are right now. Uh, that if the healthcare system overload happens, and you know it happens when healthcare professionals are tapped out, uh, when the number of people who are infected and in need of medical attention is more than medical professionals can handle, that's when the system breaks down. That's when chaos happens on the medical level, and that's when you move to a shutdown. So. Uh, we're already there, from what I hear, in places like North Dakota. You know, North Dakota, their uh, case count per 100,000 residents is at 172. That's the highest in the United States. The average in the United States is 29. North Dakota is at 172. So North Dakota, actually, just recently, uh, the governor said that asymptomatic nurses are now permitted to work because their hospital system is so overloaded, they need even these infected but asymptomatic workers to be able to deal with the overload. That's a situation, to me, that's, that's crying for shutdown. It will shut down eventually. So my answer to your question is, is, is there's no way around it. When, the, when, when you get to healthcare system overload uh, and you know, people just start dying left and right, uh, then you, you shut down. And we have started to see the, the, the shutdowns. A Prince George's County-like shutdown in North Dakota has happened. North Dakota, as of Monday, is facing a high risk levels of COVID-19 infections, which prompted recommendations. It wasn't a mandate, but recommendations that restaurants, bars, 
and other sorts of venues like that limit their capacity to 25 percent, exactly what you see in Prince George's County. And I think it's going to get more draconian uh, as time goes along. So the, sh the, the, the short answer, that was the long answer. The short answer to your question is you can't, uh, you can't uh, do an end run around the virus. Because if you yeah. do try to do that, infection rates will spiral out of control and the eventual shutdown will be even worse than it would be if you had taken precautions earlier. Interesting. OK, I've, I've got a question for you, which is that so during while um, cases uh, spiked um, from you know, March to July, let's say, um, stocks did very well, particularly tech stocks, particularly stocks like Netflix and Zoom. Um, if we have this scenario where you say where the virus continues to get worse, um, the value stocks uh, uh, get performed very poorly. Um, economic activity shuts down. Do you think that we will also again see uh, tech stocks performing very well? You know the Fang names, but also the sort of uh, up and comers like like Zoom. Yeah, I think they will perform well, but I think a lot of the uptake has happened already. You know, one of the um, one of the takeaways that I had from uh, how bullish people were with regard to um, the vaccine is that uh, this new normal that we're living. It's not normal at all. Uh, the, 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 there's a certain reversion to the mean in terms of our behavior that's going to be expected and desired by most people. In terms of people will go back to restaurants, they're going to go back to hotels, they're going to go back to airplane travel in due course, and that uh, you know there might be some residual impacts uh, from the virus in terms of how people continue to act. Let's say two or three years down the line. But the narrative I see emerging from the recent trading activity tells you that the lifestyles that you and I and everyone else listening to this is experiencing right now, all of that is totally unsustainable and nowhere near uh, the post-pandemic daily lives that we're going to have. So to the degree that Zoom and Netflix you know, went up, 90 percent of that move is already baked in uh, from the first uh, go round. I don't see a huge amount of upside there from the second go round. Yeah, interesting. Um, and, and it kind of makes um, uh, value stocks, a, like, and particularly identifying the good value stocks in a particular sector, the ones with the strongest balance sheets that have the highest chance to survive. Like owning those stocks is kind of like a binary call option on their survival because it is going to end sometime, like you say. Um, and Russell Napier uh, says that to Brett Johnson in his interview, uh, which comes out tomorrow. It's very good. Um, it is going to end sometime. It's it's just a question um, of when. Um, before Ed, I, I kind of have a, a special thing I want. I have a little bit prepared for uh, for for you and for the viewers. <laughs> but before before we do that, I just want you know we review the price action in bonds, um, in stocks, um, both in value and growth. But just um, today on the volatility. Uh, markets. Um, I'm just looking at the VIX future curve from today and from yesterday. And normally, uh, you know, it moves up and it, or it moves down, but the shape stays quite similar. But it, it really is remarkable. Um, like it's become so much more flat. So the volatility has uh, increased on the spot price um, as well as um, uh, December and January, um, particularly more. So you can you can see that. The, vol uh, the volatility markets are pricing in um, exactly what you're saying. Uh, they're, they're, they are very, very worried. That's not a good sign. But you know, to your major point on that, I think that there is an advantage to be taken here uh, of understanding who's about to hit the wall, the, the, the players that you were talking about earlier in our uh, conversation, and the ones that have the strongest balance sheets that can that can eke it out, that can m make the grade. You know, a Southwest versus a UAL or mm -hmm. an American Airlines. You know, uh, JetBlue. Who who has the strongest balance sheet? How much is government going to intervene in those markets as a result? You know, the, uh, I think uh, Bill Ackman. You you were tweeting about this actually. Uh, he's making a big call that he's back to where he was in March in terms of IG credit. He thinks that uh, there, some of these companies are going to get downgraded and the Fed is not going to have the wherewithal to be able to step in there and they're not going to do it quickly enough anyway for him not to be able to profit 
uh, uh, before IG credit gets gets savage. And obviously, if IG credit gets savage, then yeah. you know the same thing is going to happen in high yield to a greater degree. I think the the Fed will eventually step in, but once they do step in, uh, damage will already have been done. So people like Ackman will probably make money. And uh, some of these companies will have gone to the wall, and they won't be able to stop that from happening. But if you do your homework, then uh, there is a a, a a value over growth place uh, that I think has legs uh, over the, the the longer term as the vaccine gets rolled out, and as we we have this reversion to the mean in terms of our our activity. Uh, we'll, we're going to see that those uh, those stocks with those strong balance sheets that were unloved are going to over overperform. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. It could be a scenario where the uh, Dow Jones gets obliterated and value as a category gets obliterated. But to those prudent investors who have picked, um, you know, sort of uh, the, the diamond from the rough, um, they they will. Get rewarded, you know, Ed. You actually mentioned something earlier about uh, bond spreads, investment grade credit, and high yield, and it, it strikes me just how low they are. Um, you know, they're actually about as low as they've been since uh, February. Um, so, so the Fed interventions in the credit markets um, continue to be successful, and I feel like that's kind of the ultimate paradox that we're facing, which is things with regards to the virus um, and the real economy, uh, and you know. Christmas is approaching. A, a lot of you know retailers get you know eighty percent of their profits from this season, and uh, the economy could be shut down if not officially, then by people's behavior, as you pointed out in your newsletter today. Um, but so there's there's this, this massive contradiction, and I feel like you know we we've been pointing out this contradiction ever since April, really. But it's it's only heightened, um, and I feel like there's kind of been you know a little bit of a paradigm shift. Um, so. We at Real Vision are kind of like embarking on a series to explore that paradigm shift. I feel like we cover it, but now we've we've really uh, done quite a number. And I feel like over the next two weeks, we're going to be you know on this journey with you viewers um, into exploring this. So we've we've talked to some of the best investors in the world. I I don't want to say their names uh, now. Ed, uh, do, you, do you want to say anything? Because I'm just I'm a plug machine. I'll just plug plug plug. So. <laughs> well, you, you know, uh, uh, even before you started that plug, you know what I was thinking about, and and as you started doing that, uh, this whole thing about the paradigm shift, I was thinking about Jeremy Grantham because I was talking to Max, uh, uh, who was plugged into an interview that Mike Green is doing with Jeremy Grantham, uh, and he was telling me that Grantham, his views are somewhat changed. He he is looking at a true paradigm shift in terms of these stay-at-home stocks, the fangs. That it, things are different now than they were in, say, the year 2000. So when we talk about paradigm shifts, and we're saying that we're getting all these great investors, Sam Zell is another guy who's going to mm -hmm. be on. Yes, I'm excited to find out what they have to say. Some of these things have been taped. Some are going to be taped, like Jim Chanos is is coming on. So w what's actually happening now? How much of this stuff is actually um, is durable? That's the real question. Uh, and how much of it isn't? Uh, and, and when I speak to Jeremy Grantham, I go back to the uh, conversation I had with Leon Cooperman, which is in the back of my mind, who was telling me that he's willing to pay 40 times earnings for the FANG stocks. That, that's huge. Um, yeah. uh, is, that, is that durable? That, that's the question. I mean, so that, to me, that's a paradigm shift. Yeah, uh, Ed, that's so true. I think I remember in your interview with Leon Cooperman, he said uh, that bond are not a risk-free reward. They offer a reward-free risk because they have very little convexity and they offer such a low yield. So I do think we are in a paradigm shift. And that's what I think we're trying to do with these next two interviews. We're trying to give people, give investors, the Real Vision community, investment ideas for a world that's changed, for a world that's in flux. Um, so you mentioned Sam Zell. Kirill Sokolov is going to be speaking to Sam Zell. Um, we've got Chamath Palapatiya. I was talking to Rao. Uh, Jim Grant is coming back to speak to William White about central banking. Right. Yeah. Um, Hugh Hendry is talking to Rao. Jim Chanos, he's talking to uh, Mike Green, actually. Um, so yeah, we've really got the best investors in the world. Um, and I'm so excited about it. Um, and I, I hope that the, the Real Vision community will be once they hear about it, too. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, in your excitement is genuine. I, you can always tell when you're really excited, like you really get into this. So it definitely excites me. It's infectious. It makes me, you know, no pun intended. Oh, well, yeah. Well, careful, careful, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm excited about it. I, I want to see, I mean, here's how I'm thinking about it. What do these guys think about what's happening right now? Because, you know, I laid out uh, three things that people are talking about. Risk on versus risk off. Inflation higher, yields higher versus lower, and, and yields lower, and then this value versus growth. To me, those are the three big uh, scenarios that we are talking about uh, for 2021 and probably beyond because uh, of this paradigm shift that uh, the um, uh, you know the COVID-19 crisis has wrought on the global economy. Yeah. Um, I'm so excited for this. I honestly, when I just say those names, I kind of, I feel like it, it can't be real. I, you know, so I have to pinch myself. Um, I think the next two weeks are going to be fantastic. So if you're someone, you know, if you're someone who, um, you're new to real vision, you're just getting into real vision, uh, I would definitely, uh, join us because you, you could not have picked a better time to join. And if, you know, you've been a real vision pro member for uh, four years, well, just, Stick along for the ride. You're gonna you're gonna have a fun time. Yeah, you're a better hype man than even <laughs> Ash Bennington. Bro. Oh no 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 never. <laughs> I'm I'm okay, but I'm I'm no Ash Bennington. Well, good, Jack. It's been great to talk to you. I have to say, let's do it like let's have you on like once every week. For goodness sakes, I mean this is good. I really appreciate uh, uh, the conversation. Yeah. Count me in. I'm always grateful to uh, be part of the main segment. Um, I, I love uh, talking to you, and yeah, hope to do it again next week. All right. I'll send you a calendar invite right, at, right after this. <laughs> you can't weasel out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, Ed, Ed Harrison, managing editor of Real Vision, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Uh, it's been a blast. Um, Till next time.